01642 is the number. Angelica Schneider is the North East Lib Dem candidate in the Euro elections. Angelica, good morning to you. Good morning. And Jonathan Arnott is here. Now, Jonathan is uh, UKIP lead candidate for the North East in the Euro elections as well. Jonathan, good morning. Good morning. So the po this poll, at least, would suggest that UKIP won. So what do you say to that, Angelica? I think the real winner from last night's debate were, um, uh, was the, the British public because I think it's a really important debate um, to have and I, I, I think both uh, 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 both leaders put across their, 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 their case very well. I think that um, uh, on substance Nick Clegg clearly won the debate and if you Why, if why, you, why did if he win listen, on substance? Well, I think he just had the facts, um, uh, whereas uh, 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 Nigel Farage had a lot of emotion. Um, Nick could actually back up his arguments with uh, pragmatic facts, um, and he um, really convinced, I think, on, 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 on the details. Was Nigel Farage a bit flaky on facts then? <laughs> absolutely not. You know, Ni Nigel knows his facts. It's, it's been absolutely clear. But you look, you look at that opinion poll, look at the detail of that poll, because 30% of people who said they were pro-EU going into that debate said that Nigel Farage won it and even 20 percent of the Lib Dem voters said Nigel Farage won that debate. So I think it's absolutely clear that if Nigel was convincing people who were against UKIP before the debate started then that really shows that Nigel must have had a big win last night. So what could Nick Clegg have done then to improve his performance do you think? Well, I think Nick did very well, and if you if you look at the polls, thirty six percent in favour of Nick Clegg. I think that well, I think if you look at uh, other uh, Lib Dem polls at the moment, if you look at the thirty six percent, I mean he's done he's done really well, and he's convinced um, uh, Conservative voters, he's convinced Labour voters who want to stay inside the European Union, and um, and and he was a clear winner of of making making that case. But fifty seven percent as opposed to thirty six. Well, the, the not, British public is generally good. more Eurosceptic, and, and I just started off. As a, a, a more popular party leader with a more uh, a popular message and a very easy populist message, and I think um, that's the case of not having had a debate for 40 years. I mean, the um, out campaign, the Eurosceptic campaign, has been uh, 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 campaigning uh, for 40 years without any sort of like um, opposition from the from the in campaign. And the Lib Dems are the only party now standing up for um, for being inside the European Union, being a proactive partner. Well, was Nigel Farage? scaremongering particularly over immigration there was this this leaflet produced wasn't there that, that had been circulated uh, some time ago warning that 29 million Romanians were going to come into this country and Nick Clegg pointed out there aren't 29 million Romanians in the country anyway what Nigel Farage said was have the right to come into this country and so there are 29 million people from Bulgaria and Romania who have the right to come into this country but as it got, happens he, he two million, well, no, no he didn't because there are, there are 27 million in the country already and 2 million who've already left to go to southern Europe that makes 29 million there are 29 million from Bulgaria and Romania who have the right to come into this country and actually there's 483 million across the European Union who have exactly the same right plus anyone who can get a passport for any of those 27 other countries. Now we're not saying that everyone's going to come here. What we are saying is that there is a real danger of open door immigration. Well, it's uh, basically saying there's uh, 63 million Brits that have the right to come into Middlesbrough. I mean, that's the same sort of like um, equivalent. Yes, 63 million people have the right, um, Brits have the right to move to, to Middlesbrough. Will they come? Well, that's debatable, isn't it? But the problem that you've got, Angelica, is that it is a different type of immigration. Where you've got people coming in who, uh, who are either looking to take uh, jobs that are, that are often on minimum wage, undercutting people from this country. You saw last night the builder, for example, who was saying that people are prepared to take that job on minimum wage and people like him are being put out of work as a result. But if, if, if we come out of the EU, aren't we putting jobs at risk? I mean, Nick Clegg was quoting a figure of three million. Well, this is exactly that. The, you talked to me about scaremongering, and three million people are in jobs which depend on trade with the European Union. Outside the European Union, we would still trade with the European Union, so none of those jobs would be at risk. Well, I just would like like to come back to the immigration because I think it is important to point out that it is a two-way street that Brits have the right to go uh, abroad and, and live and work abroad just uh, within the European Union, just like uh, European citizens have the right to come to, to, to the UK. Uh, with 
regard to jobs, well, just listen to major Northeast employers, listen to, to Nissan, listen to Tata Steel, listen to Hitachi, listen to Siemens, listen to Nestle. They're all saying uh, being part of Europe is, is part of our business model. It's part of our investment strategy into the UK. Um, there's thousands of, 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 of jobs um, that uh, these people em, em, employ. Listen to your employer. Don't listen to Nigel Farage on the issue. Big business scaremongered. They scaremongered over the euro and those businesses then subsequently expanded. Of course, big business doesn't like the idea that we wouldn't have excessive EU regulation. Of course, business, big business doesn't like the idea that small businesses would be able to compete. But when you look at the, the opinion polls, they show very, very clearly that, uh, that, that across all UK businesses, they say that the costs of the single market outweigh the benefits. We are talking about the big televised debate last night. Nigel Farage versus Nick Clegg. Uh, who do you think won? Uh, we're talking about all the issues that he brought up last night. Angelica Schneider is here. Angelica is the North East Lib Dem candidate for the Euro elections. Jonathan Arnos is the UKIP lead candidate. Let's bring in Neil Clark, who is a political commentator. Morning to you, Neil. Morning, Mike. How are you? Um, well, what did you make of it last night, then? Well, I think there's no doubt watching it as sort of neutral. I'm not a member of UKIP or the Lib Dems. I thought that Nigel Farage won, hands down. How come? Why? Well, I think he's got three advantages. Firstly, uh, his style. I think he comes across as more affable and more engaging than Nick Clegg does. I think, uh, regardless of what one thinks of his politics, he's a very good speaker. I think him and George Galloway are by far and away the most effective speakers in British politics at the moment, so I think there's that point. Secondly, I think the trouble that Nick Clegg's got, remember, remember back in 2010 and the debates he took part in then, uh, he got a very good rating for those because he was the new guy. He was the outsider who was taking on the political class. Uh, now, of course, Nick Clegg is part of the ruling elite. And of course, there's widespread disenchantment with the whole of the government apparatus really in Britain at the moment and, and the ruling elite. So he's got that against him now. So, so you're, you're uh, telling me Nick Clegg lacked passion and, and was almost too polished? I think so. I think that Nigel Farage has got this great advantage is that he's posing as the outsider. He hasn't been in government. Uh, and so he can attack Clegg as being a member of the government, which is very unpopular. And of course, Clegg had that advantage back in 2010 when he was going up against Gordon Brown. And so I think that uh, really uh, Clegg comes across, I think, as too polished, too on message. And of course, we all recall that he made those promises about tuition fees, didn't he, in 2010? And he broke those. So can we trust this man anymore? Whereas Nigel Farage hasn't been in government, so he's still got the trust, I think, so, so to speak. Angelica. Uh, well, as I said, yesterday was a, was a battle between facts and emotion, and I, I do um, agree that um, uh, Nigel was very emotional, very passionate, he was very shouty, and he was speaking as the outsider, and, yeah. uh, and exactly. quite clearly um, does not have uh, uh, the sort of like facts to pack, back up his emotion, but on, on, on the points of passion, he, he was quite passionate, and I would have liked to see a little bit more passion from, uh, from Nick Legg in, in terms of uh, the achievements uh, with regard to the EU, uh, European Union of uh, uh, keeping peace, um, building a very prosper, uh, 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 building a prosperity across Europe. Um, but they haven't, have they? I mean, that, I mean isn't, defending that, it, that. isn't that a basic problem, Angela, that they haven't kept the peace? We've had the wars in the Balkans. Uh, we've got troubles well, in the Ukraine. Well, the Balkans weren't part of the European we've Union. Got, they're now, they're, in they're the now being incorporated into the European Union. Prosperity is on the decline in the EU all over, whether you talk about, have you been to Greece recently or Spain? This is a basic problem between rhetoric the EU, at the moment, whether we are for or against it, you can't say the EU is bringing prosperity to the people of Europe. Living standards are falling across the continent. Do you think, do you think Neil, anybody changed their mind having watched the debate last night? Well, I think a few people might have done, because I think, as Angelica has already said, Nick Clegg didn't show enough passion. You know, uh, if he did come out all guns blazing, yeah, but he not, came out... And I think Farage, I, you know, I, I think it... Uh, I think that there will be a lot of people who already watch that with their minds made up, let's face it. And there's but, another one next yeah. week, isn't there? So, yes. so so what does Nick Clegg need to do next week? He's got to show more passion. He's got to go out there. You know, uh, you know, he does believe in the EU. He's not dishonest. He does believe in the EU. But he's got to show, you know, make the case more passionately and take and take the arguments on head on. We all know that the EU is in a bad way economically. It's no good denying it, as Angelica's just done. No, but he's, got to explain, it. he's got to explain why the problems are and why he thinks that Britain is better off in the EU. I don't think he convinced sort of floating voters last night that we should stay in. Wasn't, wasn't um, uh, Nigel Farage a bit hot and sweaty? Well, yeah, but I put the point is people want to see passion. George Galloway always shows emotion and passion when he speaks. 
And I think people want to see that. I think people, Mike, are turned off by these sort of plastic politicians sounding like robots. What's wrong with a bit of passion? So it's all... Tony Benn. Tony Benn was loved. And what did Tony Benn have? He had that sort of passion. So it's all about personality, then? It's got nothing no, to do no, with politics? No, it isn't. It's about a combination. You've got to have the right policies. You've got to be able to argue them, but you've got to be able to come across as sincere, that you really believe in them and you've got passion. People respect politicians who do that. And if you just come up and, you know, sort of stand up there a bit like a robot and uh, sort of on the sound bites all the time, I don't think people like that. People are turned off by that because, of course, Tony Blair has turned people off that style. I still think that people like Cameron and Clegg are still trying to model themselves on Tony Blair. That might have been good in 1997, Mike, but it's not very good in 2014. Jonathan? Well, I think it's absolutely clear that Nigel Farage won the debate. As I say, 30% of people who were pro-EU before said that Nigel Farage won the debate. Every single measure says that Nigel won it. And on facts and figures, you just have to look at what, what was going on in immigration. And Nigel Farage absolutely nailed it. If we get the, the, the yes-no in or out referendum, uh, which the Conservatives say they will give us if they win the next election... Do you believe, then, voters have got enough knowledge to be able to come to the right decision? I think no, voters will have enough knowledge to come to the right decision. We had an hour-long debate yesterday, and it showed that people who were previously in favour of the European Union start to see just how flaky it is. They now know that it costs us £55 million a day to be in the European Union. But that's Union. not true, is it? Because we it get rebates. Exactly, it is we, exactly, get, we get rebates back for all sorts of things that, that money can be spent on. Listen, that is the amount of money that we physically hand over each day to the European Union. We get some money back, and we are told by the European Union how we must spend it. Would you... You know, if I asked if I asked you to give me twenty pounds uh, and I would give you a ten pounds Marks and Spencer's voucher in return, you wouldn't go for that. Obviously, you wouldn't. But it allows. That, but, it, but, but as a as a result of doing that, we are part of the world's biggest economy, aren't we? And if we leave the EU, then then all that disappears. We are the world's sixth largest economy anyway. And of course, what happens because we're in the European Union? We're in this insular protectionist customs union that actually stops us from negotiating our own free trade deals with countries across the globe. Actually, this is yesterday's club. It is a failed club. It's a failed organisation. It's causing us no end of problems. Well, because of the European Union, we have over 70 trade agreements with countries across the world. And uh, because we are part of the European Union, that means we can actually get a much better deal because we're negotiating as a, as a block of 500 million citizens rather than a, a block of, of 60 million citizens. And, uh, uh, but we're getting a deal that's not suited to the UK. And that that's so the not problem. True. Like the, Iceland has no. a deal that's suited to Iceland, for example, when it trades with China. Well, for example, if you take the, 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 the trade deal with Singapore, the, um, the the reason why it was held up for a while was because the European Union was holding out um, for British banks because um, Singapore didn't want to give British or uh, European banks the same uh, sort of like access to the market that American banks have, and the European Union held out until that was sorted. The, 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 the UK, the Brits, are on, 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 it, on, on, on their own. Okay, we'll, we'll, that. We'll, we'll talk to Brian. We'll take a call in a moment. We'll talk to Brian in Netherfields in just a moment. Thanks. Brian, morning to you. Yeah. Good morning there, Mike. Good morning. Did you see it last night? I did, yes, yes. And uh, as with a lot of these debates, I think the, the, the issue here, or the, the benefits that I think Nigel Farage had, is that he was able to go straight on the attack. You, It's always harder, I think, when you're in power to, to defend. Um, Nigel's got nothing to defend there. He's just basically on the attack. And was, so, he, was he flaky on the facts for you? Um, well, I think there's always this question. I'm, I'm always wary of facts and figures that I'm presented with because facts and figures can always be manipulated by the person who's presenting them. But yes, I, I did feel as if that's where his weak spot was, that, um, that you know, they were able to come in with, you know, the, the attack on that thing about the 29 million. But I, as a sort of sensible person, I could see the point he was making that, yes, uh, you know, these people have the right to come here, as Angelica said, you know, that people have the right to live in Middlesbrough but they won't but nonetheless being able to be attacked on those numbers does undermine you and and did Nick Clegg lack passion oh, I think I think most of the once you're in power it's easier to have passion when you're not in power um it seems um I suppose maybe you know you look back and you think Thatcher who you know did seem to have the passion that she could even when she was in power but um but yeah he did sort of lack that passion that Nigel Farage had but again is that a thing that you lose as you get into power and you realize actually all of these things you want you can't have um, as easy as when you don't have to deliver on the goods and so what was the hottest issue was it jobs or was it immigration 
Um, well, I think it was immigration is, is the, the, the main thing, and I, and I do think that's... The, the, the thing is, both parties had, or both parts of this debate, had some really good points, and I think, you know, Nigel Farage's big point is just to to restrict the immigration. We don't want to stop it. Um, it is just about making sure we get it right and we don't just have this open-door policy. Well, um, as we were saying before, it's a two-way street and there's about as many Brits living in other European countries as there are Europeans yeah. living in uh, in the UK. And uh, and uh, and there are issues around um, immigration, for, um, especially if, if if it's a it's a, a very quick change in a short sort of like uh, time period and, and in terms of like adopting to changes. But um, overall, um, we've seen that immigration on European uh, immigration has uh, has had huge benefits for the for the UK economy and. Um, um, I think Nick Clegg made that point uh, very well last night. But the problem that you've got, Angelica, is you're talking about Brits living abroad, but roughly a million of those Brits living abroad are pensioners who are taking money out of the UK, who are being paid pensions uh, through the UK government, whereas we're talking about people coming into this country who are not bringing money in. Now, there's no problem whatsoever with immigration from those 27 other European Union countries. My problem is that we currently have unlimited immigration. And what that is doing is that is bringing people in who are prepared to work at minimum wage, or in some cases below, for jobs which previously would have been £10, £11, £12 an hour. Now that means that people in the UK are being put out of work as a result, so even if those people are actually contributing more to the economy than, uh, than they're costing the economy, it has other costs. All I'm asking for is a bit of common sense, a bit of uh, a bit of management of this, and to say let's actually have a system of work okay. permits and bring people in with the skills that we actually need, not a complete open door. Is that something that concerns you, Brian? I think it is. Yeah, I think it's uh, that Nigel Farage very fortunately has hit on a, and I think that a, a lot of people are concerned about is this this open door policy. That I, I don't think anybody denies the fact that immigration is. Yeah, but he, he, he was talking, wasn't he? He kept quoting this figure, 485 million people potentially coming to this country. Well, we know that isn't going to happen. So is that scaremongering? Uh, it is. I think it is a bit scaremongering because, yeah, suddenly as you're being told that, people who don't sort of maybe take an interest in it think, oh, flip the neck, these people are going to turn up on the door, just as, as they did with the 29 million um, Romanians and whatever. Suddenly we had these... and the the press, unfortunately, were part of that, where you, you had this image that these people were sat at the door waiting to come in. Uh, so that, that's where the passion comes in. He can, he can fuel sort of the, the, the rhetoric, the, whereas um, uh, Clegg was able to at least bat that off with sort of, sort of some facts and some sensible facts and figures. And the unfortunate thing is, is that then comes across as him not being passionate okay. because, you know, he's having to use the figures. Angelica? Um, yeah, I just wanted to come back on some of the points that uh, uh, Jonathan had made. Um, the, the University uh, College of London has estimated that um, uh, uh, European migrants uh, contribute 34% more in taxes than they receive in benefits as a start. Um, uh, if you look at uh, pensioners in Spain, the Spanish health system, um, uh, it costs Sp the Spanish health system about uh, 200 uh, million euros a year to um, uh, take care of, of British pens pensioners in, in, in Spain. So the, it, it's a give and take situation. And also I wanted to point out that we're living in a global economy. So yes, of course we would like all li like to raise the minimum wage and living wage. But at the end of the day, if um, if we can't compete at a global level, then uh, you know all these jobs will just disappear to other countries and other regions like uh, India, like China. Um, you know, if we if, if 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 we can't make our economy competitive, then that's what's going to happen. We're going to lose jobs. But the example from last night was someone who was working as a Builder. You're talking about an industry that is within the UK, and you're talking about people who are losing jobs as a result. You're talking about 34% more uh, that migrants are contributing than in benefits, but you've also got to take into account all the other public services that are being used. You've got to take into account the loss of jobs to the UK economy and so on. And you know what? We still want to have some of that immigration. We want to have the people coming here who are going to make a difference, who are going to make this country a better place. And so actually, 
we should have a much bigger benefit from immigration, and we would do. But if we, we do, didn't don't, discriminate. Don't we? But, but if we, we didn't discriminate and say it's okay for anybody to come in from Poland, Romania, Greece, wherever it happens to be. But actually, we're going to have stringent checks on people from India. All we want is a simple, fair, points-based system but like you, they have in Australia. But are you not worried that if we pull? Out, I'll come back to the jobs issue because I think people really worry about this. You know, we, we, there, are also, there are examples in the northeast with this sound particularly, uh, and we heard, didn't we? Uh, you know, 10 days ago that Hitachi have decided to move their world headquarters from Tokyo to London uh, because of our membership of the European Union. All of that is put at risk, isn't it, if we pull out of Europe? But whilst we're in the European Union, we see businesses moving from the UK to Turkey, for example. Whilst we're in the European Union, uh, we're, we're actually stopping oh, jobs right. from coming to the UK. I mean, you look at the report from, from Ruth Lee, for example, which, which suggests that, we're, that outside the European okay. Union, without that regulation, we'd have half a million more jobs. But you know what? Trade is guaranteed okay. by right, treaty. Right, right. If we left the European Union, we're guaranteed by treaty to have free that trade with Europe. Angelica, that final word, final word to you, not. Angelica. Um, well, I think... Um, I just wanted to come back to a point that Jonathan made earlier uh, when he was saying that small businesses would like the, um, uh, the UK to leave. Actually, all uh, business organisations across the UK have uh, come out in favour of UK, uh, UK EU membership. Um, there's, there's Digby Jones, former director general of CBI. Business for Britain poll, 46%, 80, 37%. 80% 80, 80 of, bis 80 of businesses uh, in the CBI survey have said that they would like to um, uh, did the UK to stay part of the EU. Um, the City of London has come out, the, Europe, uh, the UK's manufacturing organisation, EEF, the Federation of Small Businesses, um, the Automotive Council. These are all uh, big um, business organisations saying we should stay in. It matters to British jobs. OK, we shall leave it there. Thank you, Angelica Schneider and John.